a couple of more announcements called to my attention that I might make mention of here before we get into the lesson this morning. One is that uh, we want to remember Reggie, and that's Larry had mentioned to me, but that had not gotten announced. But we want to remember Reggie, Reggie's condition. If you've seen the bulletin, you know what I'm talking about, but it has deteriorated even more, and things are not looking well, and, and uh, he's getting more and more unresponsive as time has gone along. So please remember their family in your prayers. And uh, the other that we want to make note of is that Sister Mary Lee Taylor's sister is gravely ill in the hospital as well. Um, her sister is in her 90s, and she's had some real problems here lately and, and has gotten considerably worse. So please remember Mary Lee and her in your prayers during this time. I'm sure they would appreciate it, as would others who got sickness in their family. We are glad to see you this morning. I wanted to ask uh, if you'd consider a question for me just a moment in the time that we're going to study together. If you'll look at this with me and think for just a moment about uh, what each of us, how we view our commitment. I, it may very well be that as you look at what I'm about to present, that in your mind you'd think, of course I intend to do this. But look, and let's talk about it for a moment and, and see because it takes something. And that is, are you in this till the end? When I, when I say yes, I'm being the cause of Christ, the church, service to the Lord, worshiping the Lord, things like that. Are you in this till the end? And when I say the end, I mean the end of your opportunity. I don't know when that will be. I don't know if the Lord's fixing to come back. I don't know if um, things are going to happen in your life or my life that will change, you know, anything that we could do. Uh, Sometimes, you know, people can have a stroke or heart attack and their opportunities they may not die, but their physical opportunities are just not there anymore. Uh, and, of course, another big end is if you were to die. But are you in it to the end? We all will have a cutoff point at some spot. So are we in it to the end? And that's what I want us to look at. And, and look, look with Jesus for a moment. It's something he said in Matthew 24, at verse 13. And he says this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now that's why this is important. Because it takes going all the way to the end of however it ends. Whether it's the Lord coming back or you dying or whatever it may be. The end of your earthly opportunity. It takes that in order for us to be saved. You notice he's really stressing the need for endurance. And we have a problem in our culture today because a lot of people don't endure. They don't, they don't stay with things very well. And uh, they start things, but they don't finish things. And, and some things that, that may not matter a whole lot about. I think people are kind of in an age where they kind of think underachieving is okay. And I, I realize not all of us can do the same thing. And that, you know, that, that some students are not as good as other students. If anybody ought to know that, I understood that in school. But you know, you might drop out of college because it just right now, you, you may be not succeeding at it or whatever. And giving up on that is fine. You know, that if that's, if that's what you have to do and see that you're just not cut out right now to do that or, or maybe it's just too difficult or whatever, you need more time, that's fine. Uh, you know, if you're a young woman trying to learn how to cook and you're cooking a pie and you just mess with it, mess with it, mess with it and can't seem to get that pie in any decent form, then, you know, if you give that up, that's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, maybe you can come back at it and try again later. But you know, all of that's terribly different from dropping out when it concerns your soul. This is a whole different proposition. When it comes to giving up in regard to your hope of heaven, a lot of things you could give up on in this life become pretty trivial. 
This is significant stuff. And Jesus again says, you're going to have to endure to the end in order to be saved. So as we think about that, we remember what the Hebrew writer said. He, he says a lot about this, but in Hebrews 10, 36, he says, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised, what was promised. So he says, what we all need really as Christians is a great deal of endurance, a willingness to stay with what we have started and finish this thing. Finishing is, is big, you know, of all things, being a Christian is one of those big things of life that is a real challenge to finish because it's that lifelong commitment, especially as we've come at it maybe in younger days and, and have to live for a long, long time for the Lord. Well, let's think about the things that we need to endure for a moment. We need to endure in prayer, Jesus talked about. He said he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times, men ought to pray and not to lose heart. Prayer has to be one of those things we stay with and we don't give up on and we don't surrender on. That we continue on in our prayers and not give up. We may not always be praying the exact same prayer for the exact same things, but prayer is something we need to not, you know, grow slack in. And uh, if we haven't gotten started good with it, we need to we need to really work at prayer and make it a significant feature of our lives. Folks, we're going to have to really work at keeping free from the world's influence upon our lives. I'm talking about the ungodly influence out here in the world. Now, I read, that, read you that scripture a moment ago in, in Matthew 24, 13. He that endures to the end shall be saved. If you have your Bible open to that, I want you to note this a minute. If you back up one verse, you know that Jesus starts that with but, so he's been talking about something else. But what was he saying? Verse 12, because lawlessness increases, people's, most people's love will grow cold. I want you to think about that passage for a moment, because I think it explains a lot in our world today and what happens in the heart and mind of many children of God. First off, let's connect these two passages. Endurance is going, to be met, is going to be needed in order, we've got to endure to the end in order to be saved. We've already established that. But that's the contrast with this, and that is that we don't endure. And he, he tells us what the cause of a lot of people's lack of endurance. It's not, it doesn't necessarily start with them, but notice the first thing that he says happens in the world in which we live. He says lawlessness begins to increase. Now, let's understand lawlessness in the Bible because that's not people who run red lights. That's not even people who hold up gas stations. Yeah, it fits the bill. But lawlessness in the Bible uh, is a, just a kind of a synonym for sin. And the word conveys the idea. It, per, it, it literally means no law, not having law and, and the idea behind it is we don't have respect for the law and we're talking about the law of God we live as if God doesn't have a law well a lot of people are living that way today now, this isn't necessarily talking right this minute about the Christian it's talking about the world that we live in and that is lawlessness that is people living as if God has no laws that God has no expectations of them, that God doesn't expect them to get married instead of just living together, and that God doesn't expect them to work instead of live in an idle way, or God doesn't expect them to tell the truth instead of lying about things. It is lawlessness that's increasing in our world, and as that happens, he said, the love of many, most people's love, will grow cold. Now, when he says most people, is he talking about everybody in the world? I don't know. That doesn't seem to be the point. The point is that we're talking about will you endure to the end? I think what the Lord is saying is that a lot of people who started with him, a lot of people that began that journey will find themselves in a world that will grow increasingly wicked 
some versions translated that as wickedness instead of lawlessness. But if the word is lawless, and it's that the idea, in other words, that sin is growing and growing and growing exponentially, and that there's more and more people that are engaging in wicked behavior and sinful behavior and ungodly things and doing things that would have been unheard of years ago. And that's growing, and somehow or another, as that grows, and get Jesus' connection there, that's growing, that's increasing, and that means that a lot of people's love will grow cold, and a lot of those people, listen to me now, are Christians. It's their love that grows cold. He's not just talking and speaking about love in general. He's talking about their love and commitment for the Lord, their love and commitment for the church, their love and commitment for the cause of Christ, that the world becomes more evil and it influences the people of God and their love for the things they ought to have a zeal for and an excitement for and, a, and, and a, that they ought to treasure and that grows ever more cold. And so he interjects thereafter, but if we'll endure to the end, we'll be saved. I don't think he's talking about out there in the world people get more unloving. That's probably true. But I think he's talking to you and me and says, as this flood of ungodliness reaches all around us, it can affect us more and more to where our love for the right things, the good things, our love for one another, our love for the church, our love for the Lord, will grow colder and colder. You know, the Ephesian church, there's probably not an epistle in the New Testament that's more radiant with the greatness of the church and, and what it's all about. Ephesians defines the church, and, and so much is taught about it, and so much behind-the-scenes thought Paul expresses to us about the church and how it's the manifold wisdom of God, and it shows the manifold wisdom of God and all of that. And, and Paul didn't criticize the Ephesian church very much. He didn't have much negative things to say about it. But do you know, pretty much a generation after Paul wrote, came along, and when Jesus addressed the church, you remember he wrote to the church at Ephesus in the Revelations chapter 2 and 3, how that comes up. Of the seven churches, one of them was Ephesus. You remember what Jesus said? You have left your first love. They once had a love for these things. They didn't have a love for it anymore. You know what's interesting about that? In that statement Jesus made, one of the things he said is, oh, you still are hot on the tail of false teachers. And that's how you ought to be. That part was good. That you can't bear these evil men that tell that they're apostles and aren't. But he says, you, yourself, have lost your first love. You know, even when we can be busy about, you know, making sure everybody believes the truth, we can gradually be eroding in our spirits where we don't love what we used to love. We don't appreciate what used to be. And this is something that happens partly, at least, because of time and the influence of ungodliness. That affects some people in the realm of attendance, as we well know, here at Union Road. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 we have the scripture, it seems like here lately, I've nearly had to make some reference to it every week. But you realize that when he says this, it, it really comes out in the form of a command. When you say not forsaking, you're saying forsake not in the scriptures. You're telling the Christians of that time, do not absent yourself, do not forsake in their time because the love of many was growing cold the habit of some had grown to forsake but he says forsake not and that we all have to keep encouraging one another lack of endurance was a lot of what the hebrew writer had to talk about we're told not to grow weary in well-doing this happens he says in part because we don't reap when we do it. We, you never reap in the Lord's kingdom. You never reap at the time that you 
plant. The light doesn't happen in nature either. But the whole point is you're, you're putting in the seed in the soil right now. You're doing the deed. And so he says, in due time, we will reap. But we must not grow weary of that well-doing, of doing good. While we have the opportunity, let's do good to everybody, especially those of the household of faith, but all the good we can do, let's be doing it now. His whole point there in sowing and reaping, and that context is kind of about that, but his whole point is some people grow weary because right now you don't get anything out of it. I, that's in, a, in an eternal sense you don't. Right now you don't reap all the benefit of having done good, but can you stop and think about the fact that he's having to say this because sometimes even in just trying to be good and do good and do righteous deeds and do right towards other people and all of that, do we realize that sometimes we just get flat tired of that? We kind of give up on that. We don't do for others and we don't think about others and we don't have the right attitude towards other people that we should. And so in time, we get tired of doing good. And he's talking to us and warning us about that and saying we must persevere. Don't lose heart in that respect. When it comes to God's truth, some are carried away by strange doctrines. But Paul wrote us in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, so then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. You must stay with the truth. Time has a tendency to introduce and let the devil introduce false ideas that could corrupt us and lead us away. And yet he's warning us that we must stay with that. We have to endure in the same truth that the Bible taught us and not depart from those traditions. We will, at times, go through difficult days. It might not be the exact situation talked about here, but he discusses in Mark chapter 13, verses 12 and 13, brother might betray brother unto death. Father might rise up and be against the son. Children might rise up against their parents and would even be willing to cause them to be put to death. This suggests, obviously, persecution. You shall be hated of all men, for my sake, but he that endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Now, that, that's another time, obviously, that Jesus says that. If you endure to the end, you'll be saved, but it's not the same context exactly because before he was talking about that, that people will grow colder and colder because of the wickedness in the world, and, and they won't, you know, brethren will grow colder and they won't have the love that they ought to have. Well, here he's talking about that there will be hatred and, and there'll be enmity from people and there'll be persecution for the cause of Christ. And the stands that we may make might be unpopular stands, that it might, you know, lose us uh, people, that it might make other people look down on us or whatever it may be. He says, but you have to endure until the end in order to be saved. You must stay with this even if it gets difficult to be a child of God, even if persecution were to come upon us. Well, how do you do that? What, what, what's going to have to happen for us to endure to the end? The Bible talks about this. Just use a few more moments here to talk about this. First off, it's very important to stay focused on where you're headed. Stay focused on the prize. Stay focused on the goal. Jesus, it says in Luke 12, verse 2, He's going through the difficulty of the cross, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't you think that as Jesus entered the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was so upset and his heart was so riveted with sorrow and all of that, don't you think that he had to get hold in his heart of the idea that on the other side of the beatings and the mockery and on the other side of the nails in his hands and his feet and on the other side of hanging on that cross while the men laughed at him and, and joked about him and gambled for his clothes and all the rest and on the other side of the intense thirst that he would feel on the cross 
And on the other side of, of all of the pain that would go through that and all of the shame that would go through it, everything about it, so much so that he would say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That beyond all of that was a resurrection. And beyond all of that was an ascension to the right hand of the throne of God. He saw that, so he endured the cross. He despised the shame. That doesn't mean quite what it sounds like. Despising in the scripture sometimes, just like Esau despising his birthright, and the idea is you're treating it as a light thing. Most of the time that's not good, but in Jesus' case, he treated the fact that they were shaming him and putting him through all of this he treated it as a small thing by comparison to what he would receive on the other side. Paul says something very similar about this to us. He says the momentary light affliction that we're going through are light. They're momentary in their life, even though they may go on for years and years, and even though they may be very severe, but they're momentary in light because there's an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That's a lot of part of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. An eternal weight of comparison. If you think about this, momentary is contrasted by eternal, and light is contrasted by weight. And he's saying what we go through here is momentary and light because that over there on the other side is eternal and weighty, eternal weight of glory, W-E-I-G-H-T, that kind of weight we're talking about. Stay focused on the goal. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize, so run in such a way that you may win. That's the idea of the runner, focused on the finish line idea. And Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, I understand I've not already obtained it. I I'm not, uh, have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold on that which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, that's my goal. And that includes leaving behind the things that weighted me down, leaving behind the things that once were important to me, shedding those things so that I can move on forward, and I look ahead to my goal, and I press forward to those things. But one important thing is when you're focused on your goal, when you're looking to the goal of heaven, when that consumes your attention in your mind, one thing you got to always remember is, I'm not there yet. I don't have it yet. I'm not across the finish line yet. So let me press until I've crossed the finish line. Another thing that has to be remembered about enduring till the end is to be careful not to let anything entangle us. Using again the idea of a race concept of being a Christian. He says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily could entangle us. Let's run with endurance the race that's set before us. Don't let anything stop this race. Don't let anything slow you down in this race. Another thing that is necessary to endure to the end is to remember that this is about something bigger than you. What do you mean by that? Well, think about this. In Acts 20, verse 24, Paul is talking, and he says, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. When did Paul say that? He said that to the Ephesian elders that he called to Miletus. He talked with them and, uh, you know, about their work, but they were trying to get Paul not to go on, and they pled with him. Many people pled with Paul 
Don't go down to Jerusalem. You'll be arrested. Don't go down there. And, and Paul says, I, none of that counts. He says, I do not count my life as dear to me. I want to finish my race. That's my goal. Finish my race with joy. In other words, know that I've done it, and I've done it right, and I've come across the finish line, and he says, that's what I care about. Does that mean that I'll lose my life? I don't care if I can cross the finish line. Well, he didn't lose his life right then. He would have many more years of service, but the point simply is, in his mind, he says, I don't care if that happens as long as I can do and accomplish the finish line of what God expects me to accomplish. Remember, remember, this is an important point because it affects us all. Remember, if you're going to endure to the end, you better get up when you fall. And you may fall. Matter of fact, I predict it. You will fall, maybe not in a cataclysmic way to where you quit and forsake the entirely the way of the Lord. Maybe it'll be some sin that causes you to fall. But you're going to probably do something that could end it right there if you let it. But we're told what has to happen. Of course we need to repent. Of course we need to pray. And of course we need to get, get back up in service to the Lord. But listen to how he puts this in, in Proverbs. A just man. A just man. A just man in the Bible is a synonym for a righteous man. A man who walks in the justice of God. Who, who is just because he believes in what's just and right and good. And, and he falls. It, it says seven times. But he rises up again. The wicked he falls. He falls into mischief and it's all over. He lives that life from that point on. But the just man, the righteous man, he falls seven times, but every time he fell, he got up again. So will the just man, the righteous man, fall sometime in his life? Yes. But if he's really just, he can get back up on those feet and go to it once again and don't end the journey just because you have failed today. Endure till the end. And keep your support system, by the way. Keep your support system. We read this a little while ago about not forsaking attending, but he said, let's think about how we need to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together. You know what? The very first thing that the devil wants you to get you to do, I'm, I absolutely believe it. You say... The devil wants to get you out of the assembly. And you, you think, oh, I don't know about that. Yes, he does, because that's your support system. The de if the devil can attack you and get you out of the assembly, this in a little bit at the beginning and a lot later on, if he can get that, he's attacked the help that you've got. He's attacked the, the, the co-workers that would stand with you. He's attacked the worship that might bring your heart back. He's attacked the influence of your fellow Christians that, that would be thinking about you and, and admonishing you. He's attacked and taken you away from the song that might have tugged at your heart and reminded you, I can't give up. He's got you away from all of that. And he's got you out there in the world where those things aren't influencing you. You're losing your support system. You know, it, you, you think about it in James 5, 11, he says, we count those blessed who endure. Now, we've heard about the endurance of Job. You see the outcome of the Lord's dealings. The Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. You may wonder why I put that scripture in at this point, and it's because it's here we learn about Job. It's here we get examples like Paul and Peter and other great men of God. This is where we learn about these stories. Because I'm going to tell you something. You go home and watch the television set, and I watch it too sometimes. You go home and pick up the newspaper, and I read it too. You go home and pick up the magazine. They're not going to tell you how to get to heaven. They're not going to be talking to you. That's why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not against having a TV or a magazine or a newspaper in your home. I'm just saying the point is that is there, they're not telling you, stay with it, stay with the Lord, serve the Lord, be faithful to the Lord. They don't care about any of those things, and they're not going to try to help you endure to the end. 
the Lord has designed the church to be that mechanism, the assembly and the association we have with fellow Christians to be our support system. And it's just not a surprise that when he's trying to lure people away, that the first thing that happens in their lives is not let me get them corrupted with immorality. That happens sometimes, but most of the time it happens by let me get them out of the assembly. And then these other things will provoke them back to a righteous life. When we get here, we know about guys like Job. We learn about things like that, and we're reminded about it. Let's remember this one thing. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. We're still with that question, are you in it till the end? The wise man said the end of a thing is better than its beginning. That, that might be debated in your own mind. You know, is that true of everything? I don't know about everything, but important things, the God all ends. It's not the beginning. The beginning is exciting. But how does this thing end? You know, you can be there and we are joyous as God is when somebody is baptized in the water for the remission of their sins. But when somebody's body is laid in the ground and they're in Christ, you know how the story really ends. Because I tell you, having lived 58 years and preached 39 years I believe it is I know a lot that started great and ended terribly so if you endure to the end you'll be saved if you stay with this thing you will be saved you see those words never, never, never never, never give up Winston Churchill spoke those words one time. He spoke them in more than one form. On another occasion, he said, never give up, never give up, never give up. I want to tell you real quickly a story about that. Winston Churchill, I, I know our youngest of people in the audience probably don't even know his significance. And frankly, almost all of it was before my time. By the time I was born, he was quite old and sick out of the picture mostly politically you just heard a little bit about him from your parents because he was a part of you know England and, and the World War II and how he fought you know for his people and, and strived to try to keep them you know staying with it through the war many may not even realize that they were just horribly the Nazis were horribly bombing England over and over just taking every structure out virtually that existed over there, just decimating them. And yet, he was trying to rally his people. But when Winston Churchill got old and in, infirm, he was asked to make one day a commencement address. And he, he, went, he went to this commencement address. I guess it was a college address, a university. And when he got on stage, somebody had to help him get up to the podium and when he got up to the podium he was clinging so tight to it you could just tell it was everything he could do you know to stand up there and he said there was just this longest pause nobody knew what was going on had he just kind of lost it or what and finally that's when he said to that group of young people he says never give up never give up Never give up. And they said that he actually finally turned loose of the podium, having said only those words, <coughs> and walked off the platform. But you know what? That's the lesson he learned. England, with ours and others' help, persevered, and we won. And we won the prize in the end. It was hard. It was a time I don't know anything about, just the reading about it. But it was hard. But they didn't give up, and they won. And that's what you need. And so it didn't matter whether it was a war or whatever. 
if it's something precious, never give up. And when it comes down to your soul, which is the most precious thing of all, as Jesus said, if you lose it and gain the whole world, what would you have profited? When it comes to your soul, never give up. Never give up. Stay with the Lord. This isn't about a world war. This is about a war with the devil. It's about winning the prize that Paul talks about. That prize is eternal life. It's been good to listen to the things that I've had to say. Would you consider just very briefly God's plan of salvation for you? That upon the hearing of the gospel, what we will hear if we look biblically is that we must believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and repent of our sins and confess Christ as God's Son and be baptized so that our sins might be washed away. Our baptism, just for the record, is a baptism for the remission of sins. People practice baptism, but it's erroneous. This is baptism for the remission of sins. Be faithful. Be faithful unto death. That's what we've been talking about this morning. If we falter, confess our sins, repent, and pray to God for forgiveness, of those sins. While we stand and sing a song of encouragement, if I speak to you, you please come and listen.